What's going on? Woo. Welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Football Fellas Podcast. Wednesday, March 8th. Luke is hanging out with you. And I am joined by both of my co-hosts this round. Woo! Uh, yes, sir. I have Cameron Lawrence and Tyler Plath joining me back on the podcast. It's great to have all three fellows back in one space yes, in a brand new layout. We're out here up in our game this offseason bringing you A-plus content. Trying to bring you A-plus content. Big season of transition for us, though. Uh, we have a great episode coming up. Dynasty buys and sells. We each give you two of our favorite buy candidates, two of our favorite sell candidates in Dynasty Leagues right before free agency here. Uh, and I don't think we should keep the people waiting. Well, fellas, how are we doing? Cameron, you're doing good? I'm excited to be back. I mean, me and Tyler finished our feud so we can be on a podcast together now. I mean, it's good. Like, <laughs> settled the beef. Ready to go. It's just been me and you or me and Ty. Yeah, exactly. So now, Ty, the beef is settled on your end then too. Uh, I, I, I think he keeps changing my score on the golf card. I swear I'm shooting a 67. He swears I'm, where I'm shooting a 76. I don't really know. But hey, you know what? We're back. We're on good terms. That's what matters. We're only playing nine holes, but <laughs> <laughs> and it's mini golf, not actual golf. Before we turn into a golf podcast, uh or we settle that? the beef podcast. Uh <laughs> let's uh I'm not gonna make the people wait. Let's uh let's dive into buys and sells in dynasty leagues. Now, originally, this was supposed to be a two-part podcast. Originally, we were supposed to have a Dynasty Buys podcast and a Dynasty Sells podcast. But if you notice, uh, we were kind of MIA last week. That's because uh, Tyler and I recorded an episode. And then it just kind of it kind of just didn't record. Uh, <laughs> we, we recorded it, uh, but my camera and microphone were just glitching left and right uh, it was my fault really uh, i take the blame for that but uh so we didn't have the the dynasty buys last week so we're putting them all into one episode right now uh, we're going to bring you six different buys players you should buy in dynasty and six different players you should sell in dynasty uh and cameron i'm going to have you kick us off here uh who is a player that you are looking to buy in dynasty leagues this offseason you should have bought him last summer when I was telling you about it. I pushed the redraft agenda one year too early on him, but he's here. He's ready to go, and that's Mr. J.K. Dobbins. It doesn't matter to me if Lamar's there or if Lamar's gone. He's succeeded in both this last season with Lamar out. He was playing at maybe 80%. I don't know if you guys you guys watched those games. I mean, he looked like he couldn't even extend his legs fully when he was running, and yet he put up 297 yards on 57 attempts in four games. Right. I mean, he's averaging about 80 yards, around 80 yards a game, two games over 100 yards, 15 attempts a game. And he was good with Lamar, too, because back in 2020, and it is, he played 11 games um, as the starting running back at the end of 2020. He had 800 yards and nine touchdowns in those 11 games. Right. I mean, the dude was on pace for 15, 16 rushing touchdowns, on pace for 13, 1400 yards with Lamar playing fully healthy next to him. So to me, this Ravens team has a good enough offensive line. John Harbaugh knows how to call plays, and Dobbins knows how to pick pick the hole, hit the hole hard. So if he's going to be fully healthy and a team that loves to run the ball, he's going to be a great, just a great guy to buy. And especially right now with so many people worried about Lamar, you know, some people if Lamar leaves, that's an upgrade to them. You know, they they would rather have J.K. Dobbins with their running quarterback. Some people if Lamar leaves, they're like. Um, if Lamar stays, that's an upgrade to them because they'd rather have that efficiency. But right now, there's just uncertainty, so both both parties are kind of looking to sell. So if you can go in a scoop of J.K. Dobbins, I don't think there's a better time to do it than right now. I'm not even going to push back on that. Like, I don't know if there is room to push back on that. I think a lot of people would say to sell J.K. Dobbins for the reasons you listed uh, in terms of we just don't know if he's going to be healthy slash is he still going to be the lead guy in this offense mm. uh, and Greg Roman leaving as well. I don't think it matters. I think they're still going to run the crap out of the football with J.K. Dobbins. Like, I don't think the identity of that team changes just because there's a new offensive coordinator coming in. I 100% agree. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with that just because, I mean, that's who the Ravens have been, you know, since the inception of the Ravens, right? You think about that 2000 Super Bowl team, they were run first and play good defense. They've, they've been that, you know, pretty much, I mean, they had a little bit of a difference with Joe Flacco because he could air it out a little, but still, they had like Ray Rice running the ball. They were always a run first team with great defense, and I think they're going to continue that. Tyler, uh, you're going to pivot away from the running back position here, but uh, who was your first buy candidate? I'm actually surprised you changed up some of your some of your opinions from uh, our previous episode. These two names you have down weren't even guys we talked about, but uh, who is your first player that you want to buy in Dynasty Leagues this offseason? Yeah, two different names from the original list. These guys almost made my original list, so they're they're right there. Justin Herbert, okay? We're talking about the quarterback two in fantasy football back in 2021, okay, where he put up over 300 fantasy points that year. He did finish as a quarterback 11 this past year in PPR formats. That hurts a bit, but it's a perfect opportunity to buy low now. Here's the situation last year, as you know, which resulted in his quarterback 11 finish. He played with broken cartilage in his ribs. You will never be the same quarterback with that kind of injury. You can play through it. You're not the same. He had injuries to other players around him. One Keenan Allen, two Mike Williams. They lost the franchise left tackle, Rashawn Slater. So he's playing with a backup left tackle who did do fairly well, but still is a backup. He had Trey Pipkins as his right tackle. (laughs) Zion Johnson, first round rookie yikes of a rookie season okay he had no good offensive line around him he had injuries around him he had injuries himself he even tore his labrum in his left shoulder that he got surgery for he'll be okay by the start of the season but all that to say he's going to get a fully healthy offense this year and he gets kellen moore as his offensive coordinator who drew some interesting comments from mike mccarthy when mike mccarthy was being interviewed at the podium at the combine Because Mike McCarthy said, my philosophy is wanting to run the ball. We had people that wanted to air it out a little bit more. Maybe that's the play caller, Kellen Moore. You get an offensive coordinator who wants to air it out, just like Herbert has done in years past. Fully healthy offense. Everyone back. We'll see about Keenan Allen, who could be a cap casualty. We'll see. Maybe not. Again, we'll see. This offense is made for Justin Herbert to thrive in. And again, you're looking at the quarterback two in fantasy football back in 2021. Don't be surprised if he climbs back into the top five again this year. Go buy Justin Herbert right now. What do you think it's going to take to buy Justin Herbert, though? Because we're talking about a young quarterback who does have top three upside in his his range of outcomes. Like, I understand you could probably get him at a slight discount, but you're going to have to pay up at least a couple first, would you not? A couple, maybe one, and then you know maybe a, a younger piece as well. It's kind of one of those opportunities for the person selling to get some influx of younger talent. And I think if you are in that spot, personally, I, I have young talent, but not super great young talent. Want you know, Kadarius Tony is nice. Elijah Moore is nice. Those guys won't do it, even though they're young. They won't. They wouldn't do it. I would, I would, I would say at least one late round first, and a young wide receiver, maybe a young running back, maybe one like Tyler Algier. If someone really, really likes Tyler Algier, I feel like that would be a a, a good package to send out for Herbert. Are we you talking think a late first? We'll get it done, and we're talking, talking one single quarterback flex? league, single, single quarterback yeah. league. Do you think a late first will get it done? I think maybe, you got maybe early first. I think so. I think someone could push for a mid. But I, I would start out with a late. And if I've, you know, if I can work my way and keep it at a late, sweet. So here's my question. Where, where does Bryce Young go? Or maybe someone wants to get Anthony Richardson. You know, he, he's probably going to go 107, 108. So I would think that you would have to sell whatever pick he's going to go at, you know, that projected pick. And then, like Tyler's saying, you know, I think of like, uh, I mean, I would throw, I would throw, I don't know, actually. You know, Rashad Bateman might be a guy you throw in there, right? Maybe someone who hasn't performed yet, but people know they have the upside. Um, obviously, for Superflex, he's going to be a lot more. 
Um, just thinking, you know, I th- I thought that was the original question, just because I have him in our superflex league. So it's like, oh, I would never give him up, you know. But if we're talking one QB, that's very different, obviously. Um, but yeah, I, I I agree completely though that if you if you have the op- opportunity to go with Justin Herbert, you should go get him right now. Oh, I I hundred percent agree. Justin Herbert's a guy you should go out and absolutely buy. I just mm-hmm. question if you can get him for a late yeah. first. I think you're going to have to pay at least a probably a late early first. Like I think because I, whoever's giving him up. You're giving, they know they're giving up a top three quarterback. And in a single quarterback league, that's not as easy to move off of. Yeah. What Especially if, okay. in a dynasty league with for how young he is. Let's say this Danny Dimes and the 108. No, I wouldn't take that. No. I would need the, uh, the 105. 105. 105 would be the latest I take. So you'd want to get like a, you know, a Quentin Johnson, Jordan Addison. Yeah. I, I want one of those elite young guys. Yeah. That makes sense. That's all I'm looking for. But I agree. I, I think Justin Herbert's a screaming buy in Dynasty Leagues right now. You should go get him if you have the opportunity to. 100%. I'm going to stick on the theme of quarterback for my first buy. Uh, and I'm going to take a guy who didn't play. A, well, he did play a game in about 10 snaps last year. Uh, Trey Lance. Screaming buy for me right now. Screaming buy. I will happily invest in a Konami Code quarterback if people are just ready to move off of him because of Brock Purdy, because of the injury he sustained last year, if people are ready to jump, like move off of him gladly, gladly, I will, I please send me an offer with Brock Purdy or not Brock Purdy, Trey Lance in it. I will, I will gladly take Trey Lance from you. That rushing upside is invaluable. And and here's the thing about Brock Purdy. He's nice. Okay. He played really well for being Mr. Irrelevant. Like that dude surpassed all expectations. He was phenomenal. I'm not going to downplay how good Brock Purdy was given the situation he was thrown into, given his draft capital, given the success he saw. I'm not going to downplay him. That dude is com- dealing with a complete tear of his UCL in his elbow. Complete tear. And he isn't getting surgery on it until March. Um, and we're in March 8th. I haven't heard news. Do we know when his surgery date was exactly? If he's had that surgery yet? I, I just know heard. it was in March. Let me confirm that for you. Yeah, you can confirm that for me, and I'll keep going. From his surgery, he sidelined six months afterwards. Now, I'm not a math major like Cameron Lawrence was, um, but if I do my math six months after March would lead me to September, the ninth month of the year. If it's March 8th, and do you have a date on that procedure? This Friday. This Friday, I figured it was coming March up 10th. Too. So we're looking at September 10th. The NFL season will be started by then before Brock Purdy has been cleared for NFL action. Maybe it's sooner. Maybe his recovery goes more quickly. It wouldn't surprise me given the nature of these athletes. But we're talking about a guy who might not even be ready for week one. And Maybe. they don't have another quarterback in that room. They're not going to keep Jimmy G. Maybe they go out and make a splashy move and try and bring in a guy like Lamar. I think they'd be absolutely insane too, but I never count anything out with San Francisco. All that to say, if you're worried about Trey Lance because of Brock Purdy, you have every reason not to be worried about Brock Purdy because that dude is dealing with a severe elbow injury. He went to get a second opinion on, right? He didn't want to have to sit out six months, but sounds like he's going to have to now. So we're talking about a battle with a guy who couldn't even be ready for week one. He probably won't be 100% healthy during training camp and mini camps, giving Trey Lance all the opportunity in the world. 13 rushing attempts in week one last year. 13 rushing attempts. That upside, rushing upside alone, insanely valuable. I will, I will gladly invest low on a Konami quarterback, or who could be a Konami quarterback. We could talk about a guy who could see 10 rushing attempts every single game, throw for 200 yards, add a couple touchdowns in there. I couldn't agree more. I just think he's he's so good. We can't ignore the draft capital either, right? They give up three first to get this guy. So he's either going to be starting on this team or they're going to trade him so he can start somewhere else. He's played like two games, right? You're either going to trade him because you need to kind of recoup some of that draft capital you had on him or you start him because you you have no idea what you truly have in Trey Lance. Uh, and, and that's exactly it. I like. I know people will say Kyle Shanahan don't give a crap. Kyle Shanahan does what he wants. I don't know, man. When the front office trades three first round picks to trade up 
to the third pick to get this guy. I don't know. I think the front office is going to have something to say to Kyle Shanahan, and I don't think that's going to be ignored by Kyle Shanahan. I refuse to believe that. Let's keep it moving here. My first buy, Trey Lance. Uh, Cameron, your first buy was J.K. Dobbins. Uh, Who is your second buy in Dynasty Leagues this offseason? This guy that I already bought myself um, two different places, Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, He's a guy, actually, he was one of Lucas's cells, so I won't spoil the trade, um, to go get Michael Pittman. But he was the only wide receiver with over 100 receptions to have less than 10 yards per reception. Okay, actually, it's not quite true. Chris Godwin had 9.95, so I'm going to round it up to 10. Um, Michael Pittman was at 9.91. Right, that, that is historically low that, I mean, for players with over 100 receptions. But he's also posted back-to-back top 20 years with Philip Rivers and Matt Ryan. And these aren't like the old, Philip Rivers and Matt Ryan of old. These are guys who are just dinking and dumping, can't get anything done. And in those top 20 finishes, he's had only 10 touchdowns combined over the two years, four in 2021, six this last year. He, I mean, he is a big guy, right? He's six foot four, like I'm. Um, 95 percent sure of that and so he's gonna be a red zone target at some point they're gonna figure that out of how to get him the ball in the red zone you give him any of these rookie um rookie quarterbacks and they're gonna be looking his way that's that's what these guys do is they look the way of the big wide receiver they look the way of the guy who's more of a for sure catch so if he's gonna still see the targets the yards per reception has to go up i mean even if it's 12 right it goes up two yards per reception he's sitting at 1200 yards last year he had two more touchdowns. This guy's borderline top 12, and I think that's kind of where he can sit moving forward because even if Indy decided to bring in a wide receiver, which I don't think they bring in a, like a first-round wide receiver this season, he's still the wide receiver one this year. Still probably wide receiver one or wide receiver one B moving forward off of that. So Mike Pittman for me is a for sure buy. And you're not – like I know you, you mentioned rookie quarterback coming in. That's what they do is they hyper-target a guy. Like you're still not concerned that it's a rookie quarterback adjusting to the NFL throwing to Michael Pittman. I mean, obviously there's going to be headaches, but you've had Philip Rivers and Matt Ryan. I mean, it's not like you've had you're, you're you know you're not going Carson from Wentz. Josh yeah you're not going from Josh Allen to some rookie quarterback. And I mean, if they take a rookie quarterback, they're taking either you know they're taking either a guy at one or a guy at four. They're taking one of the top three. So you know, I I just think they're gonna go get their guy. They're gonna get a guy they trust in, and you give them a, you give them a full off season. All right, I mean Michael Pittman is gonna be the guy they work with the most. So yeah, I'm I'm gonna believe and trust in Michael Pittman moving forward. And even if this year isn't great, he's 24 years old, right? He's still got seven years to be really really good. So he's for sure a buy for me. I'm not going to talk you out of him being a buy because I do like this. I do like Michael Pittman being a buy candidate, but does your level of trust in Michael Pittman change, whether it's CJ Stroud or Will Levis at quarterback, because that's kind of what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. You're looking at either CJ Stroud or Bryce young at the first pick. If they trade up to one, or you're looking at probably a Will Levis at four. Obviously, you know, I mean, just CJ Stroud, I've loved everything I've seen from CJ Stroud. Obviously he'd be my preferred target for Michael Pittman. But even, you know, even if it's Will Levis, I still think, you know, they they get the ball, the guys. I mean, you look at even last year, like a lot or two years ago, like we're looking at, I'm going to just say Elijah Moore from two years ago, right? He had Joe Flacco, Mike White, and Zach Wilson. Like he still got the ball this last year. Garrett Wilson still got the ball with those same three guys. So quarterbacks can get you the ball. And if you're good, you know, you, you get rewarded. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about, um, like a Will Levis, obviously a little, little disappointed if that is what that is the case, but not too worried about it. I'm not going to discredit your thoughts at all there, but I'm, I also want Tyler's opinion on this too, because admittedly, like he's done more homework than no, you 100%. these quarterbacks. He's, he's I'm not trying to discredit leader. anything you said, yeah. but Tyler's, you've looked at both Stroud and Levis. Um, your thoughts, because it, it feels like those are the two that Indy is eyeing very heavily right now. It seems like those are the two they're going to either pick at either one or four. Um, wh- how does that impact Michael Pittman? Does it impact Michael Pittman if it's Stroud versus Levis? I think maybe the best way to explain it is like what the worst could be in terms of like who's the worst quarterback that any could have and play with. Sam Ellinger is still in the building, but I don't think he's going to see the field with Shane Steichen now as a head coach. But you do know who is a free agent from Philadelphia that knows Shane Steichen? Carson Wentz. 
No. <laughs> Good guess, though. <laughs> Gardner it's, Minshew? It's Gardner Minshew. Okay. I To me, I think that's the worst it can get. And to me, Gardner Minshew seemed, you know, relatively competent enough to provide some kind of volume for Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown. That's the worst. Obviously, C.J. Stroud, Will Levis, even Anthony Richardson are better quarterbacks than Gardner Minshew. Yeah. So if you if you look at it that way, it, it, there's really no bad scenario for Michael Pittman unless they bring in a, a first-round wide receiver, which they absolutely will not, or they go and sign a big-name free agent wide receiver, which there are none of this year. So I really don't think there's anything that can really hurt Michael Pittman's situation this year. So put that on top of the low value that he's at right now. It's it's a no-brainer to go get Michael Pittman right now. Yeah, I, I would agree. It's, it feels like the only way is up for Michael Pittman. Yeah. Like it, it, it can't get much worse than it was last year with Jeff Saturday, a head coach, and the makeshift, the, the mixed bag of quarterbacks he was getting. It, it feels like it can't get worse, and the dude is still young. He has a few more years of production left in him. And if you get a young quarterback like Stroud in there, I would love to see CJ Stroud throwing the ball to Michael Pittman personally. Uh, And that's coming from a guy who is a non-believer in Ohio State quarterbacks. Uh, This is a guy who, look, Stroud's my quarterback too in this draft, but uh, I I still have low expectations about him (laughs) transferring into the NFL just because I haven't seen an Ohio State quarterback do it at a pocket passing level. Dwayne Haskins was supposed to be that guy um, rest in peace. No disrespect to Dwayne Haskins, obviously, but like that was the last guy out of Ohio State who we thought would be a great pocket passer in the NFL, and it just didn't translate. But all that to say, Michael Pittman, go out and buy him. I I do agree uh, with that analysis. Definitely. Ty, let's move it to you. You're going to stick with wide receivers here uh, because your second dynasty buy this off season is Terry McLaurin, Mister Scary Terry himself. And Terry McLaurin has really been a relative definition of consistent over the past three years. He's had at least 120 targets, 75 receptions, a thousand yards receiving each of the last three seasons. But the killer, the killer for scary Terry and really his Achilles heel has been finding the end zone. I, I can't, I'm suffering, you know, some short-term memory loss. I don't know if you mentioned the stat about Michael Pimmons touchdowns over the last yep. two years. Terry McLaurin has only scored 14 touchdowns over the last three seasons. Like it's not been good for scary Terry in the red zone, but there's optimism here. The quarterback argument can be made here for Washington. I, I Ron Rivera says, Sam Howell's in the competition. It is not a guarantee that he's a starter. And even when Sam Howell was a starter, it wasn't all doom and gloom. There will be growing pains. Absolutely. But it sounded like they're in the market. Could they go get a Lamar Jackson if they wanted to? Could they go sign Jimmy Garoppolo? There, there are options for Washington to go get another veteran quarterback. Even one of my sneaky favorite kind of, quarterback free agents for Washington is Jacoby Brissett. Jacoby Brissett with the Browns last year, he had Amari Cooper playing as almost a top 10 fantasy wide receiver. Yeah. So it's it's not like Jacoby Brissett is incapable of giving, you know, in, in supporting that kind of volume for his wide receiver. So the quarterback argument is there for Washington. Eric Bieniemy is now the offensive coordinator. Yes, Eric Bieniemy's specialty in uh, um, area of expertise is mainly with running backs. So this actually was very close to becoming Brian Robinson. But Terry McLaurin is going to be the guy for whoever the quarterback is. So he gets Eric Bieniemy. He's going to get some kind of stability at the quarterback position because if you also look back the past three years, Taylor Heineken, Carson Wentz, Sam Howell, right? He's going He's going to get stability. He's going to get a creative play caller with Eric Bieniemy. 
Ty, I gotta stop you. You said Heineken. Bro, I know, like, <laughs> he got beer on the mic. Right <laughs> he got a beer on the mic. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say that, but I couldn't keep straight. I, I, I was cracking a smile over here. <laughs> you Not just a kept sponsor. Rolling, I didn't want to stop you. You were, you were a on sponsor. a roll. Not a sponsor. <laughs> Taylor Heineke. There, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for catching that. You're welcome. Um, no, I, I. We'll we'll just end it there. Go by Terry McLaurin. <laughs> I'm sorry, I completely like just. Well, it clicked after you said it. I was <laughs> like, oh, and you, you're right. My bad. <laughs> yeah, I was. That, that's my bad. I'm derailed. But I mean, I I definitely agree. I mean, as much as I've like been down on Terry McLaurin, his floor is wide receiver 17. I mean, that's I mean that's his floor because that's what he's been and he's going to continue to be that. I I believe is his floor. So that's that's where I'm at. I, I still think his floor is like wide receiver 25. I'm still like iffy on him. That being said, like I don't hate Terry McLaurin as a buy candidate. You're not worried about him like being a bit older in the league. Like again, like I know I brought up his age last off season and people were like, Oh, he's only 26. And I'm like, uh, he ain't no spring chicken like DJ Moore. Uh, some of these other guys he came into the league with who still have a lot left in the gas tank that frankly, I would rather invest in right now than Terry McLaurin. Um, that, Creeping up age doesn't really concern you. I believe he'll be 28 going into this season now, or will turn 28 mid-season if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Yes, he will. It doesn't really concern me. Okay. I think, I think he's in the 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 later stage of his prime, where an offensive coordinator will still say, "We got to get him the ball. We have to give him opportunities to make a difference in the game." He's done that over the last three years in terms of volume. I have to think that the enemy gets a little more creative with him, you know, and let, you know, either in the red zone or finding opportunities for McLaurin to make something happen for him to take it home. Yeah. And and I'm not going to sit here and say that like Terry McLaurin won't be productive the next two seasons. It's more of a, like a longevity outlook for me of, I don't know. Once Terry McLaurin hits 30 in two years, like, am I still going to be as in on him as I was when he was 27? Right. Yeah, like that, that that's the only reason I'm asking that question. But like in the meantime, like I, you're right. I, I like the dude has top 12 wide receiver in his range of outcomes. He absolutely Definitely. does. Um, my concern is more of the longevity and like, would I rather try and invest some of the pieces I'd go get to get Terry McLaurin to instead invest in a guy with a little bit more longevity. But I, that doesn't take away from the fact that I do think Terry McLaurin is a good buy candidate yeah i'll wrap this up with our buys here we've talked about every position other than the tight end position so i'm going to wrap us up with the tight end because i'm the tight end guy on this podcast <laughs> pause i can't believe i said that out loud but uh mike is sick you can have it <laughs> <laughs> mike is uh ty you went out and made a move for mike is uh, in our dynasty league, I absolutely love that trade that you made. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you remind the people what you gave up for Mike Kosecki? I gave, I gave up a 2024 fourth round pick and a 2025 third round pick. Uh, and, and like, and you have years Jeez. to recuperate that third round pick. And people are like oh, a third round pick. Uh, you have two years to recuperate that pick. Yeah, that's pretty. Look, <laughs> look like he Mike Mike Kosecki was an awful fit with Mike McDaniel. Okay. Mike McComing, you couldn't get two more opposite tight ends than George Kittle and Mike Gusecki. Uh, so Mike McDaniel coming over from San Francisco, having the luxury of George Kittle, who is the most ferocious blocking tight end in the league, can also get it done, pick up yak. Mike Gusecki is not that. Okay, Mike Gusecki, he's too big to be a wide receiver but he's too small to be a quality blocker at the tight end position. And frankly, he's just not that great at it. It's just not a strength of his game. Can I say he kind of smells a lot like Evan Ingram this off season where he's going to find the right landing spot. Like I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> like, like, like seriously, like all Evan, Ing- Evan Ingram left for dead by the New York giants. That's fine. He wasn't doing Jack squat there, but he gets into the right system. But Doug Peterson, who loves to utilize the tight end position, he had both Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard thriving in Philly, right? Gusecki was a 700-yard receiver. Like, I know that's not a massive feat, 
But at the tight end position, that's a lot. Okay. We're not like, you're not getting a ton of thousand yard receivers at the tight end position. 700 yard receiver in both 2020 and 2021. Like, if this dude, it, it like, if they go, uh, sorry, goodness, I'm thinking three different thoughts at once and they all wanted to come up. <laughs> um, <laughs> if Mike Isicki ends up with the Chargers, if he ends up with the Lions in, in a dynamic offense that wants to throw the football, and, and don't need him to be a blocking tight end. Like, there could be some serious usage there in some dynamic offenses from Mike Gusecki. Now, that being said, I, I wouldn't be surprised if either of these teams pass on him to draft a Michael Mayer, uh, a Dalton Kincaid, um, to wait on a Darnell Washington, right, to get someone similar to Mike Gusecki in the draft, but also... I mean, I could see these guys again. Mike is sick. He's proven. Why would you take a chance on a guy with first round draft capital? Keep that first round pick and invest on the other side of the ball when you can go out and get Mike is on a prove a deal. Um, yep. I, I think there's a ton of upside there for Mike is And if you can go get him for a 2024 fourth round pick and a 2025 third round pick, and you have a year to recuperate a fourth round pick, if you actually care about keeping a fourth round pick, and two years to recuperate a third round pick. If you really care that deeply about your third round picks, that is a no brainer to me for immediate impact. I will gladly sacrifice future and future investment to recuperate it later to get immediate impact right now at the most desolate position of fantasy football. Yeah. I mean, you brought up the 700 yards. I just looked it up. Seven tight ends had 700 yards or more. That's it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's like 700 yards. You hear it as a wide receiver, like, that's gross. Cool. You know, tight end. And let's say he goes to one of my spots I like him going to is the Giants. Yeah. Let's say they use him like a Dawson Knox. He puts up eight touchdowns. He's a top six tight end with 700 yards and eight touchdowns, right? He's top five tight end. Put, you know, he's knocking on that door with the injuries and stuff. So there's a lot of ways where if he finds, starts finding the red zone, catch seven or 700 yards receiving, he's going to be a really good asset for you this year. It's not hard to be a top 10 tight end in fantasy football. No. And that will be in Mike Kosicki's range of outcomes should he land in the right offense, which I think is highly likely. Yeah. All right, before we uh, transition to the cells here, uh, let's take a quick break and hear from our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. <laughs> Today's podcast episode is brought to you by our friends over at Underdog Fantasy. Now, we love Underdog. It is the easiest place to play best ball formats, and they even have their own form of player props called Pick'em. You can make up to 20 times your money on a single night by correlating props together. Two picks will triple your money, three will six times it, four will ten times it, and five plays that all hit will multiply your entry by 20. You can even place insurance on your picks too, so if only four of your five props hit, you still get ten times your entry. And if you use our code FELLAS when signing up, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100. All right, let's move on to our dynasty cells now. Uh, we covered J.K. Dobbins, Terry McLaurin, Trey Lance, Michael Pittman Jr., Justin Herbert, and Mike Kosicki in our players to buy in dynasty leagues. Let's move on to the cells now, Cameron. And who is the first player you are looking to sell this offseason? For me, it's Tyler Algier. I th think there's been a lot of people who have kind of fallen under the um, – Spell of Tyler Algier being the running back one down in Atlanta. You know, he's a great steal, fifth round pick. You probably picked him with the third, um, third round pick in your rookie draft, or you got him really late last year in redraft. And Tyler Algier is not going to be the one A starting running back of the Atlanta Falcons this year. We got to remember Arthur Smith is a guy who gave Derrick Henry 400 plus touches two years in a row, right? He wants to run the ball nonstop, so they're going to bring in someone else no matter what, because nobody other than Derrick Henry and, you know, a couple other guys here and there for one season can handle that kind of volume. And so they're bringing in someone no matter what. And when you're a fifth round pick or later and you don't have receiving work upside, you get replaced pretty quickly. Elijah Mitchell from last year, right? We look in, look in the league right now. There was only two, two guys in the top 20 running backs who were fifth round picks or later. At any point, it's Aaron Jones and Austin Eckler. And what do both of them have? Receiving upside, right? That receiving upside gives you more opportunities, gives you more chances to excel in the NFL because when you're a fifth-round pick, you get one chance, right? You're not – it's not like Clyde Edwards-Hilaire where you get 55 chances 
to prove that hey, I can't I can't cut it as a running back one on a team, right? You you get one and done. You get injured, and a team brings in someone like CMC, and you're out. And there are so many fan um, running backs this year. When we were talking about earlier in our group chat, right, we came up with a video for um, free agent running back spots. I had said Miles Sanders. You guys said um, David Montgomery, right? There's been talk of them trading for Derrick Henry. You could bring in a Devin Singletary. All these different things could happen. There's so many different options for them to bring in that they're going to bring somebody in. There's a super deep draft class right now for running backs. That without that receiving upside, Tyler Algier is either going to completely just be a 50-50 back and just split split rushing work with no receiving upside, or he's going to be the 1B, you know, maybe around the goal line and stuff like that. And you just hope that he can have a Jamal Williams type year where the other guy gets hurt. Yeah, I think that's his ceiling right now. So if you're expecting, hey, maybe I got a sneaky top 20 running back, you don't. I'm sorry. That's just that I mean, that's how I feel about Tyler as you know. Draft capital. We we have to realize draft capital means so much for these running backs, regardless of how well you play your rookie season. Yep. Uh it, unless if you prove you can be elite, like a Dalvin Cook who went in the second round. DeAndre Swift is getting plenty of chances. These are all second round guys, though. Those two are second round guys. Who else, another second round guy? Um, I can't think. It was Joe Mixon wasn't a second round, was he? He was. Joe yep. Mixon, second round pick, right? But proved he's an elite playmaker. But again, we're talking second round guys. Brees Hall was a second rounder, right? Mm-hmm. So these first second round guys are far more locked in. Unless if you get a rare class 2017 draft class was that with cmc uh and uh, who else was in that draft with well, kareem lenny. Hunt. what was that lenny lenny for lenny yes well in that whole draft that class where you were you were you're getting guys into the third fourth round who were who pr- ended up being studs that's not the, that's not what we can expect of these running backs yeah uh tyler algier is replaceable isaiah pacheco is replaceable mm-hmm Michael Carter last year, who looked really good for the Jets. They went out and drafted Brees Hall. And people were still willing to say, look, Michael Carter, dude, he looked great. He's got more juice. Brees has to adjust. Brees was the far superior running back to Michael Carter. He's replaceable. Anybody who's drafted in the third round or later, replaceable. And that's for the Atlanta Falcons. I 100% agree. I jumped on the sell Tyler Algier train. Ty, what week did I trade him to you? Like week 13, 14, maybe late, late in the season. It was late in the season when he was starting to pick up steam. And I said, I'm just going to take advantage of it. Young, high upside. And then Tyler, you actually went and sold Tyler Algier this offseason now already. So I think you and I are in agreement there that, yeah, Tyler Algier, phenomenal rookie season. Great thousand yard rusher. Look great. Downhill runner. Probably fits an Arthur Smith type scheme. Just not as talented as some of these other guys they could bring in, though. Yeah. I don't think Arthur Smith wants to feed the ball, Tyler Algier the ball 20 plus times a game like he did with Derrick Henry. I just don't yeah. think that's the range of outcomes. Yeah. I mean, obviously he took over the backfield from Cordero, but just the fact Cordero was getting, you know, rush attempts at all just speaks to, hey, Tyler Algier is not going to be that guy, right? Cordero's 32 years old, not even supposed to be a running back, right? You're, he's not, he shouldn't be cutting into your carries if you're really that guy. And so I, I don't know. That's, that was kind of all. All I needed to know was draft capital and just kind of seeing what we saw last year. I mean, I think there's a good chance, you know, knowing the draft and prospects and all that kind of stuff. Zach Charbonnet in the third round to Atlanta is like, it's the perfect fit. Like it makes too much sense. That's, that's the kind of situation you find yourself with Tyler Algier. I couldn't agree more. So, Tyler, I'm going to kick it over to you now. Uh, based on the doc, looks like you're going to stick with the running back position unless you're going to pull a fast one on me and uh, go with your second guy like you did uh, for your buys. But uh, your first player you're going to sell this offseason uh, is who? Well, I will defend myself here real quick. I didn't read super well that Michael Pittman was Cam's second guy, and I purposely put in a transition with or a reference to Michael Pittman. So I was like, Oh shoot, he didn't go Michael <laughs> Pittman. And so I had to I had to switch it up on you. So this time I will not switch it up. Travis Etienne. 
the most polarizing running back in all of fantasy football still probably because it feels like there are people that are still willing to die on the hill for Travis Etienne. And I'm the one person going up the hill and taking them off the hill and letting them live another day because this is an avoid for me at all costs. Not only has Doug Peterson already come out and said that they're looking to add more running backs to their room. Doug Peterson has backed it up his entire career. He's always gone with the committee approach. Always. So you're going to get extra competition. Calvin Ridley is back. That may have been like the one big piece of news that we didn't mention. Calvin Ridley is back in the NFL. He's on the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's another receiver in a room with Zay Jones, Christian Kirk, now Calvin Ridley, and I'll throw in Evan Ingram as a fourth pass catching option in that offense. What kind of receiving work is he going to get? I would err on the side of, not very much, not enough to really change my mind about him. All those things together. I get, I get that he's what, 23, 24 now. I get it's the young running back. You don't really want to sell too early on these young running backs. Everything though, with Travis Etienne is telling you to sell. And now is the perfect time to do it because there are people that still believe that he's a top 10 with top five upside kind of running back. Now is the time to sell it when the hype is still there, when the price is as high as it is, sell it now. You'll thank me later. Yeah, when I saw you put his name down, I was kind of surprised because I wouldn't consider Travis Etienne a sell, but you're more so advocating that his ceiling is still just a, like it, it's higher than it even was to end last season when he didn't close out last season very good. I mean, I think, yeah, the way to put it, every the ceiling has somehow rose for ETN, but everything that has happened this offseason has put a cap on his ceiling, in my opinion. So it's this kind of discrepancy of like it. I he's still going to be a solid running back. But for me, I see him more as a running back two in the next couple of years than I do as a true legitimate running back one to have on your team. Yeah, I mean, to me, you pretty much just described a Michael, Michael or Miles Sanders career arc for Travis Etienne. Um, but with that being said, I am kind of falling under the uh, Travis Etienne uh, illusion and falling for Etienne more. So I might have to be sending you a trade request here uh, after the show um, for your one share that you ha- do have of ETN. Your um, three first round picks deal. Well, no. Um, <laughs> I will still demand a fortune for him, he says, even though I'm looking to sell him. <laughs> Lenny in a 2024 second. And you got a deal. <laughs> Throw in your 25 fifth and you've got a deal. Sure. <laughs> That's but how it I, works, I think, guys. I think, I think you bring up an interesting point, though, Tyler, of when you recognize there is a discrepancy between your value of a player mm-hmm and the community's value of a player, it might not be the worst time to sell because you can you can get a package that's satisfactory for you. Now, it might not be the right move. It might be the perfect move. We like There's not much you can do about that. We're merely here to give you our opinion. Uh, you can make our opinion your opinion. That's your choice, though. But I think, I think that will goes for any player. If you see a community as far more high on a player than you are go capitalize on it because you're going to be able to get a satisfactory package. That's pleasing to you. Um, mm-hmm. There are plenty of guys who like, if I tell them to go buy Trey Lance are probably like, heck no. Nah, yeah. I'll gladly trade you Trey Lance. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm able to go get them at a price that I want to, and they're probably going to get a price that they want. Like that, that's how it works. It's perception of value. If you value a player less than the community does, it might be the right time to sell. And that that's kind of what it sounds like you're saying here. Absolutely. Yeah, I just one more thing on that, right? He's right now on keep trade cut. He's a running back five. That means people think he has running back one potential, right? He can finish running back one on a year. If you don't believe that, that means right now he's going at his ceiling. So if you don't think he can finish as running back one, you should sell him right now because his value is never going to get better than it is. 
And so even if he is great, right, even if he's the running back eight every year for the rest of his career, you got the bag right now. You got you should get good enough assets that it makes up for that in other ways. Um, so yeah, I I mean, even if I like Travis Etienne, just echoing what you guys say, like, yeah, if you if you don't believe he's a can be a running back one, then you should be selling him. Running back five, really? That's crazy. I mean a dynasty. I mean a dynasty, I I get it. Over I'm struggling to put Travis Etienne into my top 12 running backs for this next year, honestly. I don't I don't know. I'm gonna sound crazy, and I know other people in the industry are probably gonna crucify me for that. But you got me. You got me. I know I got you. you. I, I mean, got I, you. I, Cameron, you brought up the, the, the Miles Sanders arc, and, and yeah. I tweeted that out a month ago. I said, Man, is Travis Etienne just like Miles Sanders, but like with a more sexy resume? Like, yeah. like I wonder if that's what it is. Um yeah. We'll keep it moving here, though, because I think we all agree. I, Cameron, you really like Travis Etienne, and I'm more on the sell side. I don't know if I would sell him, but I, I think we kind of range in different ways. But ultimately, I think we can all agree if the community is higher on a player than you are, it's probably the perfect time to sell. Yes. Which is how I feel about the, my next guy. Kyle Pitts. I'm sorry. You got to sell him. I, I'm not trying to be... I'm not trying to give you a spicy hot take here just for the sake of being a hot take guy. I'm not. I am telling you to sell probably the dynasty tight end one. Kyle Pitts is advanced metrics. They're pretty. They are. They're promising. They're hopeful. You want to know the problem though? I don't know if the dude's going to have a quarterback to give him the football. That's my massive concern. The Atlanta Falcons don't want Lamar Jackson. For what reason i have zero clue i would have handed that man a blank check 46 mil a year fully guaranteed you got it four years you got it i would have handed him a blank check just so i could get someone in this offense who can throw the football marcus mariota couldn't desmond ritter looked nice i don't know if i want to trust desmond ritter though third round rookie from last year third round rookie or is he fourth round third he was a third round Malik Wills was fourth round. Desmond Ritter, third round draft pick. I don't know if I want to trust Desmond Ritter. Maybe they get in the market for Jimmy Garoppolo. Then, you know, then we can revisit this. I don't know if they're going to invest in a quarterback, though. His raw numbers just aren't pretty. Okay. The, the, the raw numbers that put up fantasy points aren't pretty. And this is exactly why you should go sell him because he's still viewed as a dynasty tight end one. You can get multiple first-round picks for him. Kyle Pitts is far more replaceable right now than Travis Kelsey. And people are going to want to invest in the young, promising assets. They're like, oh, I got years to buy with Kyle Pitts. I'll give up assets for that. I will gladly take your current assets for Kyle Pitts. Because I don't, like, even if I'm waiting, even if I'm in rebuilding mode, I, I might rather try and snag a guy like a Greg Dulcich. I might rather I might wait and see where Michael Mayer falls. I just think there's other young guys out there who can get it done like better than just Kyle Pitts can right now. That is to say Kyle Pitts is a bad talent. He's generational. He is a generational talent. I just don't think Kyle's gonna pay off Kyle Pitts is gonna pay off in the near future until they get a quarterback in there who can get him the football. I just have such little faith in that, that I am willing to accumulate whatever assets you're willing to give me, and it's going to be multiple first-round picks. You should not sell Kyle Pitts for less than two first-round picks. I will gladly take those plus whatever tight end you don't want to keep. Give me two first and Dallas Goddard from Kyle Pitts. I'll even throw in a compensatory second or third-round pick to make that happen. I would do that in a heartbeat. Because I think Dallas Goddard is going to produce at a pretty darn close rate to Kyle Pitts next year. So yeah, I, I, I'm selling Kyle Pitts. I'm just, again, I'm maximizing value because he still has it. Well, people just don't know. Coming off an entry, he could have had a better year. Desmond Ritter, he's going to improve, maybe. Like, there is still hope for Kyle Pitts. <laughs> there is. There will always be hope for Kyle Pitts, but now is the time you maximize your value on him because it won't get higher than the Dynasty tight end one. It won't. It can only go down, and I'm going to capitalize on that while I still can after what I saw to start last year and after they're unwilling to make a move to add a quality quarterback to their team. Yeah, I I 
do not recommend using keep trade cut as like your trade calculator your to figure out whether to trade calculator, right? Yes, right. But it's a good it's a good sense of like this is where the dynasty community at a whole is pretty close to you know right now in trade keep trade cut. He is going ahead of picks one through three for twenty twenty four for twenty twenty four. Oh, gladly. I'll take a top three pick next year for Kyle Pitts. DK gladly. Metcalf. In Superflex, he's going ahead of Deshaun Watson. He's going ahead of Tra- Travis Etienne, Saquon Barkley, Tyreek Hill, Stephon Diggs, Dak Preds- Prescott, and uh, um, the 104 through 106. That's I mean that that's his value right now, and like you're saying. All right, I will take a top three pick next year for Kyle Pitts. I would take DK Metcalf for Kyle Pitts. Right, I just think that if he is as good as he as he's promised to be, yes, he can change your team. But that's not happening this year. Um, I mean, it's it's not. So I I don't I don't know. I I agree with you. I mean, his value is as high as it's going to get. I love the talent of Kyle Pitts. I love the talent of Kyle Pitts. I loved him coming out. I knew he was going to take time to develop. But man, man, I am I'm having a hard time. I'm having a hard time seeing it with Kyle Pitts until they get him a quality quarterback. All right, let's uh, let's let's make this last round quick here, mostly because my computer is about to die and we only got a few minutes left on the pod. Uh, rapid fire, Cameron, your last sell in Dynasty Leagues this offseason. Christian Watson. He's a wide receiver 21 right now on um, Sleeper's big board. He's wide receiver 23, I think, on Underdog's best ball big board for this year. This dude is Chase Claypool. I've been saying it for all of last year. He is touchdown dependent. He's great. He's fun, right? He can run in straight lines really fast. And that's about it. He's not going to go high point the ball. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to run crazy great routes. And more than likely, he will never have Aaron Rodgers again. I'm sorry. I don't really want a, you know, project quarterback in Jordan Love who, you know, if you're the Packers, you would have, you know, you were really pushing for him to start by now if he was really that great to be thrown to pretty much Chase Claypool 2.0. You know, it just doesn't excite me. I, As high as he is, people were excited about him last year. Some people are still excited about him this year. Trade him for what you can, walk away, you know, because at his ceiling, what, he's he may be a borderline top, you know, top 12 guy. That's his, like, biggest ceiling ever you know like everything goes perfect when in reality he's probably a wide receiver 28 through 40 i mean that that's kind of where i see him landing so yeah if i could get a first this year for him i'm for sure gonna trade christian watson for something like that yeah i capitalized on it when he had his massive stretch Uh, i got a 2024 first and deontay johnson for him uh right when he was popping off and i was happy to sell him for that uh to at least accumulate another wide receiver with a decent amount of upside uh, and accumulate a first-round pick in a future year after I had already accumulated three first-round picks for this year. Yeah. Um, I was more than happy to do that. Tyler, your second sell this offseason. Was a guy that, it, it's a guy that I was relatively high on last year. Um, it's Gabe Davis. And I know last year I came out and I made the, the bold, hot take that him and Diggs could both score double-digit touchdowns. That definitely didn't happen i will hold myself accountable to that that's a hot take for a reason anyway anyway (laughs) in the back of my head though when we were making our draft guide last year back of my head i was like this is really the last year for me for gabe davis to like develop into this wide receiver two that everyone has been waiting for for buffalo you know, it was, he, you know, his rookie year was like, oh, he's got some flashes. He's going to work his way up the depth chart. The year after that, everyone's like, he's kind of their wide receiver three at the moment. And then he had the big old playoff game in Kansas City, and everyone's like, he is here. He is him. And then he laid a dud this year. And it just confirmed the thought that I had that last year was the last year for this guy to – take over the wide receiver two spot in this bill's offense. I'm moving on from that. He's a wide receiver three. I mean, there's some value there, but if he's still going and if he's still being valued as a wide receiver two to a lot of people, that's more than enough reason to get rid of him. But here's the other thing. Buffalo could 
Buffalo actually has the luxury of taking a wide receiver in the draft this year if one falls to him. Zay Flowers, if he's there, love that fit. I mean, if Josh Downs somehow makes his way into the first round, love that fit. Quentin Johnson, Jordan Addison, because Jordan Addison's stock has been falling after his combine performance. They have the luxury to do that. They also have the luxury of going out in free agency and getting a guy like Robert Woods. Shout out to your TikTok, Cameron, for that one. Maybe a guy like Nicole Hardman, right? Buffalo has the luxury of going any which way they want to replenish the wide receiver room. We have to we have to move on from Gabe Davis becoming the wide receiver two in Buffalo. And if he's being valued as that, again, discrepancy factor, get rid of him, sell him for what he's at right now. Couldn't agree more. Get what you can, which is exactly what my my last pick is, Mike Evans. Get what you can for the guy right now. I, I think this is fairly self-explanatory. Only six touchdowns last year. Three of them came in week 17 of those six. No Tom Brady anymore. If Kyle Trask is the quarterback, I'm not all that excited for him to try and feed Mike Evans the football. Now, if Mike Evans gets traded, which I think is a sneaky possibility that not enough people are talking about, great. Sell him for even more because – He's 29 going on 30. This is when we're going to start seeing, you know, players start to top out. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, Devontae Adams, Stefan Day, like these guys are the exception. These guys are the exception. But it's 30 31 that we really start to see these guys slow down. I think that's coming from Mike Evans, and the situation in Tampa Bay doesn't excite me. Cameron, you went out and you sold him, Jamal Williams, a second and a third for Michael Pittman, uh, a third this year and a second next year, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, again, you have a year to recuperate that second. You also have multiple seconds next year, right? Mm-hmm. Like you were willing to give up the extra assets to make Mike Evans look a little bit more appealing to acquire a younger piece who you could probably buy at a discount in Michael Pittman. That was a perfect example of what I would try and do with Mike Evans right now. Again, if he goes to a team where that, that has a better quarterback, great, great. Sell him for even more than uh, just an aging wide receiver. Uh, who I'm just not excited to roster, who's been you know heavily dependent on touchdowns the past few years. Uh, and and that's that showed this past year. He wasn't scoring. He wasn't putting up fancy productive weeks for you. Uh, and I think that's just his reality now to close out his career. Anything we want to add to close out the podcast before my computer decides to die on me? Dynasty is all about is not as much about getting your original prediction right, but it's realizing when you're wrong and moving on to the actual correct, you know, correct way of doing it. Ties that's thinking about that with Gabe Davis, right? Thought he was gonna be great. Watch a couple games last year. He's not move on, right? It's how quickly can you move on from when you're wrong? 100 percent And you have to balance the short game versus the long game. You gotta win now. But if your team's not built to win now, you better go out and acquire some young assets to help you in the meantime to rebuild your team for future success. Yeah. Make sure you're following us on the socials. I'm at Lucas Wenzel on Twitter, Cam Law, FFF for Cameron, Tyler underscore Plath for Tyler. Main page is FF Fellas, Fantasy Football Fellas on TikTok and YouTube, the FF Fellas on Instagram. Three Stooges just hanging out with you tonight. We're happy to be back with you. All three of us on one episode. We will see you all next week. Uh, I don't remember what's on the dock for next week. We're going to preview free agency next week. That's what's on the dock for next week. We'll be back next week. Thanks for uh, bearing with us in, in the off week here, and we will see you all then. Deuces. Deuces. Deuces.